Israel has firmly rejected Hamas' answer to the potential mediated deal for the release of the Israeli hostages in exchange for an extended pause in the Gaza war. Visiting U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken agreed that some Hamas demands were unreasonable but insisted that there is an opening and an agreement can eventually be reached. And now TV Steve Labovich has more. Prime Minister Netanyahu rejected Hamas's demand for a permanent ceasefire and an end to the war in Gaza as delusional, insisting that the war will go on. Our security and the prospects of peace in the Middle East depend on one thing, total victory over Hamas. At the start of the war, I outlined three goals. Destroy Hamas, free the hostages, and ensure that Gaza doesn't pose a threat to Israel any time in the future. Achieving these goals will ensure Israel's security and pave the way for additional historic peace agreements with our Arab neighbors. But peace and security require total victory over Hamas. The Prime Minister also insisted that only military pressure and victory over Hamas will secure the release of the Israelis still being held captive in the Gaza Strip. Many also argued that Israel's military campaign would scuttle our ability to release the hostages. Well, they were wrong on this one, too. Military pressure led to the release of 110 hostages, and only continued military pressure will bring home the remaining hostages. Visiting U.S. Secretary of State Blinken said the return of the hostages tops his agenda. Blinken agreed that there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, but vowed to work relentlessly until a deal is reached. There was severe disappointment at the lack of progress among families of hostages for the release of their loved ones. Released hostages held a press conference to remind people that the ordeal is ongoing. <laughs> Brave girl. And now joining us is Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Achoum. Fleur, if you were a family member of a hostage, what message of hope, if any, would you really have taken away from Prime Minister Netanyahu's message? Basically, no pause in fighting at this time? Well, you know, I, I believe that everybody in this country should be making decisions on the hostages like if it was their child in there. That's what I believe. Because God forbid, if it was my child, I would want everything, the government to do everything it could to bring these children home. And so I put myself in the position of those mothers, those daughters of the elderly parents who are there, and the country has to do its best to get these kids and elderly and babies out of the terror dungeons that they're sitting in right now. The country let them down on October 7th, and so we have to do everything we can. Of course, you know, the prime minister and the government have the responsibility not to endanger the country, uh, whatever deal that they do. So it really is a Sophie's choice at the moment. Uh, but, you know, in, in halacha, in our, in our Torah, in our commentaries, it says that you have to save the people immediately, even if there's a threat further down the road. And that's, I think, what we should be leaning into. Indeed. Now, at the press conference of the former hostages yesterday, not a positive word was sounded by the families about the government efforts to really free their loved ones. Do they not believe that Netanyahu is really doing everything possible to bring them home? I think that um, there's many, many different hostage families and uh, there's hostage families that think this way and others that think that way. I've met a real range. So you can't say, and I really do believe that the government and the security services are doing everything they can to bring these hostages home. Remember, they're advancing and perhaps, perhaps we can hope that they will be rescued or some will be rescued in some way. Uh, but I know that terrorists 
uh, they want to take us to the brink, but in fact, they should be begging us for a deal in the way that the army is advancing. And that's really what we should be aiming towards. It's, they don't respect weakness. Um, they don't respect capitulation. And so I'm, I'm just praying that all the pieces come together so that uh, we can bring the hostages home. The sooner, the better, because every day that passes is more dangerous for them. Uh, they deteriorate health-wise, etc. And so we really need to press forward. You know, as one of the experts said in the Middle East, you really eat hummus and not sushi. Now, Fleur visiting U.S. Secretary of State Blinken, he says that Hamas' answer to the mediated plan was a non-starter, but held hopes um, open that a deal can eventually be reached. Why not pause the war now and fight later? We need the hostages home. How do we win a war without them? I don't think you can have a victory without bringing the hostages home. Um, I really don't. And I don't think it's just a question of uh, a war military victory. I think it's, a, it's an emotional question for the country. This country cannot live without open wound if we don't deal with it. We just can't live with it. Nobody will have any faith in the security services if we don't do everything that we can to bring them home. And so this is what we really need to be focused on right now. At the same time, of course, if uh, fighting, if stopping the offensive is just going to be worse, I mean, can we really trust these people to release the hostages? Um, and if pausing of fighting is going to bring us more problems in the future, these are all, you know, considerations that the Army and Security Services have to take. But but I trust that everybody's doing their maximum to get those two missions accomplished. One is bringing the hostages home. And the second, of course, is to dismantle the terrorist infrastructure of Hamas. Without dismantling the terror infrastructure of Hamas, we will not be able to rebuild the south of the country. People won't go back to live in those communities. And then Hamas have won. And so this dual mission both as important as each other, is what we're grappling. It's not easy. I would not want to be in the position of the of the chief of staff right now uh, that has to make those military decisions. And so we just have to put our faith, pray and hope that they, you know, that, that they advance the way they need to advance in order to bring a deal and bring our hostages home. We're definitely praying. Fleur, you got to meet Argentinian President Javier Millet as a first step. He announced to move the Argentinian embassy to Jerusalem. What did he tell you during the meeting? So I'm very, very uh, pleased um, that I was invited. There's a, an organization that uh, deals with the Spanish-speaking world called Fuente Latina, and they did a private meeting with the president, who was really a wonderful man, uh, very emotional about his feelings towards Israel. And I got to thank him personally for the announcement that Argentina is moving its embassy to Jerusalem and, of course, offered all the help that the municipality of Jerusalem can offer him in order for this to happen quickly. Yes, at least some good news. Flora, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he has ordered the IDF to advance towards Rafiach, the Gaza city bordering Egypt. The U.S., the U.N. and Egypt are raising concerns with hundreds of thousands of mostly displaced Gazans taking refuge in the city, and LTV Steve Leibovich reports. We are now in day 125 of the war in Gaza, and since the start of the IDF maneuvers on October 27th, many have wondered why Israel chose to save Rafiach until the end of the ground maneuvers. The town borders Egypt, and the Rafiach crossing and underground smuggling tunnels have been the source of Hamas's ability to heavily arm and ultimately attack Israel on October 7th. The IDF maneuver began in the north, and residents were ordered to head south. Eventually, many or most displaced Gazans have now taken refuge in what is the southernmost part of the Strip. The UN Secretary General said that an attack on Rafiach would have regional consequences. And I'm especially alarmed by reports that the Israeli military intends to focus next on Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been squeezed in a desperate search for safety. Such an action would exponentially increase what is already a humanitarian nightmare with untold regional consequences. A number of times during his speech to the nation, the Prime Minister used the words total victory in describing the IDF goal in the war on Hamas. He then stressed that the army has been ordered to take action in Rafiach and two other areas in central Gaza that have yet to have IDF maneuvers. לוחמינו הגיבורים נלחמים כעת בחניונס, המעוז העיקרי של החמאס. 
הנחינו את צה"ל להיערך לפעול גם ברפיח ובשני מחנות המרכז, המעוזים האחרונים שנותרו לחמאס. נתניהו קושן that this is a process that takes time and said that the IDF continues to tackle the remaining splinters of חמאס resistance. והערב באתי להגיד לכם דבר אחד, אנחנו בדרך לניצחון מוחלט. הניצחון הוא בהישג יד. זה לא עניין של שנים או עשרות שנים, זה עניין של חודשים. IDF Chief of Staff Alevi was in Gaza to prepare to carry out the orders to eliminate remaining Hamas opposition while pressing for the return of the hostages. On the matter of the hostages, the IDF revealed a barred cell area in Khan Yunus that was used by the terror group to hold hostages. There were cages for nine hostages. Nine are still held by Hamas. The other three were returned to Israel during the November 23rd to 30th hostage exchange deal. Visiting U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on his fifth visit to Israel since the start of the war. This trip, he has expressed concerns about Palestinian civilian casualties as the war continues against Hamas in Gaza. And Altibi's Devo Klein has more. On his fifth visit to Israel since the start of the war, Blinken did not call for a ceasefire, but repeatedly expressed concerns about what he called the innocent civilians in Gaza. A U.N. team began its mission to the North to assess conditions for the civilians who are still there, as well as what needs to be done to allow displaced Palestinians to return back home to the North. And yet, as I said to the Prime Minister and to other Israeli officials today, the daily toll that its military operations continue to take on innocent civilians remains too high. Earlier, after meeting with President Herzog, Blinken claimed that many innocent Palestinians are being caught in the crossfire Hamas has created, and they must be protected. There are so many innocent men, women, and children who are suffering uh, as a result of the attacks perpetrated by Hamas and now being caught in a crossfire of Hamas's making. Um, we all have an obligation to do everything possible to get the necessary assistance to those uh, who so desperately need it. President Herzog vigorously defended the IDF actions in Gaza. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. The United States now says its forces carried out killings of commanders of the Kataib Hezbollah militia responsible for the attack on a base in Jordan where three American servicemen were killed. Explosions rocked the vicinity of a U.S. Army base in Syria, according to reports from the Hezbollah-affiliated Lebanese media network Al Mayadeen on Wednesday. Located in the Alomar oil field within the Kurdish-controlled region of northeastern Syria near the city of Deir Azor, this base has housed American troops since at least 2017. The attack was reportedly carried out by a swarm of suicide drones, which marks the second such attack on U.S. bases in the area this week. Arab media has suggested a connection between this attack and recent U.S. airstrikes targeting Iranian-aligned groups and their positions. These airstrikes were a response to the deaths of three American service members at a base near the Syrian border in Jordan earlier this week. Today's attack comes hot in the heels of a suspected American operation targeting Kataib Hezbollah commander in Baghdad. Kataib Hezbollah has been actively involved in escalating tensions, having launched multiple attacks against U.S. positions in the Middle East, including the fatal incident in Jordan. The U.S. military has confirmed its role in the attack, which occurred shortly after previous strikes on pro-Iranian militia and Iranian Quds Force targets in Iraq and Syria.
In response to the attack in Jordan, Kataib Hezbollah announced a temporary halt to their assault on American forces, urging their fighters to exercise caution. However, the frequency of attacks by pro-Iranian militias has surged since the outbreak of the war in Gaza, with over 165 incidents targeting U.S. soldiers and coalition partners in the region since mid-October. Iran has taken the news once again in recent days from cyber to drone attacks in the region. And joining us now for further assessment is former Deputy National Security Advisor in Israel, now Senior Fellow at INSS Tel Aviv, Professor Chuck Feilich. Chuck, listen, cyber attacks on Israel by Iran, the backing of Hamas, Hezbollah, Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq, the Houthis and more, each attacking in different ways, threatening Israel and the United States. How much longer can this tit for tat go on? Well, it's been going on for years, and to some extent, the conflict between Israel and the U.S. Uh, and Iran has been going on since the early 1990s. So I wouldn't expect anything fundamental to change uh, any time in the foreseeable future and probably beyond. The immediate question at the moment is really is primarily an American one, which is, the president really does not want, understandably, does not want an escalation with uh, Iran and with its proxies and has shown considerable restraint in recent months. Uh, it was, let's say, tit for tat responses, as you said. Then he realized or he came to the, came to the conclusion correctly that this attempt to avoid an escalation wasn't working, that Iran was interpreting American caution as being um, uh, something that allowed them to go ahead with their attacks. And, he, and so the U.S. Ha the U.S. had to escalate. OK, escalation wasn't working. The absence of escalation wasn't working. And so he la launched the round of a few major attacks in the last few days. Uh, first, it was 85 attacks against targets in Syria and Iraq. And then it was 30 odd targets in um, Yemen and again in Yemen, the Iranians and their proxies seem to be continuing the attack. So it's not that they haven't gotten the message, but they don't seem to understand it the way the president wants. And that puts him in the difficult position of whether escalate now or appear weak as an election year really gets underway. Before we really continue with uh, President Biden, what do you think Iran's real end goal is here and right now? Well, right now they want this conflict to end with Hamas still in power. Uh, it's taken a heavy hit. That's OK from their perspective. It's not as if they thought that Hamas could actually win a war like this. But the Iranian strategy is actually a very, very long one of, I call it attrition until destruction, until Israel's destruction. And to that end, there will be repeated rounds, some bigger uh, some smaller. This one was much more successful uh, than I think anybody, uh, from their point of view, of course, that anyone uh, anticipated. So this was a big step forward from their point of view. But they wanted to end like the other rounds with Hamas and with Hezbollah with them. Yeah, they've taken the hit, but they're still there. Uh, they live to fight another day. This time it'll take Hamas a little bit longer to regroup. But two, three years from now, they should be able to hit us so significantly again. And of course, they want Hezbollah to remain what it is. I don't think that they want to see a major escalation on the northern front, uh, which has been happening till now. It's more than uh, tit for tat. Uh, both sides have taken some significant hits. Um, they don't want that to get out of hand. It serves their purpose. We pay a price, and the price that they pay isn't uh, too heavy from their perspective. Yes. Now, Chuck, you mentioned this is an election year in the United States. But other than that, why? Is the United States continuing to sort of appease Iran? I mean, this, this will of bringing stability to the region, I mean, Blinken's visit calling to calm things down once again, how will a strong Iran bring any stability to this region? Well, this is the classic dilemma. Do you, if you, look, if you assume that your objectives are to avoid a war, but to achieve some of your other objectives at the same time, but the overriding one is to avoid a war, well, does hitting the other side back deter them or no, just the opposite? Well, maybe you're right that the American um, response until the last few days 
appeared to be one of appeasement to the Iranians, or at least a weak one from their perspective. And so they thought that they could get away with it. And now the president uh, upped the ante. He tried to escalate significantly, but not because he wants to reach a war, precisely the opposite, to deter the Iranians from it. The Iranians always like to get the last word in. Uh, and, and they and their proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas, the same way. And the question is whether they've now done that, they've gotten the last word in and they can back off, or whether they're going to continue hitting the U.S. And if that's the case, then the president's going to be in a very difficult position and probably have to escalate even more. But that can lead him precisely to the outcome that he really doesn't want, which is a, a war to begin with and a war in an election year. Now, a new report from the Institute for Science and International Security suggests that Iran is really closer than ever to a nuclear bomb, upgrading its threat level to really extreme, extreme danger. What's your assessment here? Well, of course, they're right. Iran has been progressing uh, steadily, and there are periods when it progresses a bit more rapidly and then a little bit more slowly, depending on circumstances in the region and in terms of the um, interplay, so to speak, with the U.S. and the West. Iran, for a year now, has been at the point where uh, it could have a bomb in days if it wanted in terms of the amount of highly enriched uranium. They're now at the point where they can have a, enough for about 10 bombs. The question is when they complete the weaponization process, because they still have to do that before they can actually have an operational bomb. Most of the assessments are that they need a year and a half to two years for that. We, that's an assessment that's been there. Uh, well, the good news is it's been there for over 20 years, probably more like uh, 25. For a long time. So that's the good news. They haven't broken out. They could have. It, they could have. Uh, the bad news is that they still have the capability to break out, to, to go that final mile at a time of their choosing. Hopefully, we'll know when they do it. They seem to be reasonably uh, well, um, uh, what should I say, uh, covered by various intelligence agencies. But um, there's no guarantee that we'll know. And in any event, a year and a half to two years is not a lot of time. The clock hasn't started ticking on that, to the best of our knowledge, because we don't think that they've crossed that threshold yet. But we could be surprised. Yes, Professor Freilich, always concerning. Thank you so much for joining us. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected tonight around the country with temperatures reaching lows of 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, partly cloudy skies and rising temperatures set to continue rising slightly alongside clear skies over the weekend with highs of around 19 degrees Celsius or 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our Al TV channel, subscribe to our Al TV newsletter, and of course, do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all of the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Amit Harari. Stay safe, have a great weekend, and thank you so much for watching.